Hello, everyone, and welcome to OHSC Interviews. I'm Vincenzo Calla, and I'm your host for today's episode. Today, I'm happy to have with me the former MP for Milton and former Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, the Honourable Lisa Raitt. Lisa was first elected in 2008 to be the MP for Halton. She was re-elected in 2011 and then was elected as the MP for Milton in 2015. From 2008 to 2015, Lisa served as the Minister of Natural Resources, Minister of Labour, and Minister of Transport. She ran for leadership in 2017, and when Andrew Scheer became leader, she was chosen to be the Deputy Leader of the Official Opposition. Currently, Lisa is the Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC. Thank you, Lisa, for your time, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Vincenzo, thanks for asking. I'm glad that we finally got to do this together. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad to have you here today, and uh, I guess we'll just hop right into the question yeah. and answer session. So we're going to sure. start off the interview with our question and answer segment, and these questions come from the members of our high school team. So the first one's very straightforward, a bit of reflection, I guess. Um, what achievement are you the most proud of from when you served as a minister in the Harper government? It's kind of an easy one. I took over as Minister of Transport five days after a train plowed into the middle of a village called Lac Megantic in Quebec and killed 47 people. And my goal from that time on was to do as much as I possibly could to ensure that an accident like that couldn't happen again. And we went so far as being able to get the Americans, which have an economy so much bigger than ours, to agree to remove the kinds of rail cars that actually basically opened up and exploded the way that they did full of fuel. And I, I always look back on that as the best thing that I could have done. You know, we get into politics because we want to serve Canadians, but we also care about the health and safety of Canadians. And for me, knowing that I had a little piece of ensuring that rail cars and disasters like that weren't going to happen in the future, um, that was really meaningful. So when I reflect, you know, there's cool stuff that I did, like you're allowed to use your phone on the plane and stuff like that. But this one on health and safety was the most meaningful. Well, especially as you mentioned in the aftermath of that devastating crash that yeah. we hadn't really ever seen something like that before in Canadian history, and hopefully we'll never see it again because of those mm -hmm. things that you mentioned. But really, I think that being able to know that I it probably was heartwarming to you as well to sort of be able to work on that and if if anything honor the families of the people that yes. lost members on yep. that on that accident just being able to make sure that this doesn't happen again it is very true i went to lac megantic the day after i was sworn in and you know there was still a fire burning and the way it was explained to me was there was no injuries in hospital. Either you perished or you weren't in the blast zone at all. Nobody survived. And that really hit home. And I went up to the church, which overlooked exactly where the crash happened. And I could see where people had put all the pictures of their loved ones that had passed away. And it just had such an impact on me. And I knew in that moment, you know, we were going to do everything that we could do. And the prime minister was completely on side with ensuring that we did everything that was within our power, including dragging the United States along with us to ensure, because as, as many people may not know, but our train system is integrated with the United States, especially on freight. You could pass through the United States five or six times, even if you're only going from Vancouver to St. John, New Brunswick, you still end up going into the States. So you need to have rules that apply to both sides equally. And that was, that was a challenge, but we got it done. Definitely. And such a, a great accomplishment on, on your behalf and on your government side. Um, we're going to go into the next question, which is from Vasu and Ajax. And it has a bit of a background, so we won't dive too deep into it. But right now, there's a, a little crisis for gas prices in yeah. Canada. Yeah. And right now, the current government isn't doing as much as they probably could have, or as much mm -hmm. as your government would have to, to sort of control these and help everyday Canadians. So um, as the former Minister of Natural Resources, Vasa wants to know, what did mm -hmm. you do to keep those co the cost of those resources affordable Canadians while also creating jobs in the sector? Because I know that the current government uh, doesn't really want to focus much on the oil and gas sector. How did you 
yeah. bring that all together? Well, uh, the story there is I was running for election in 2008. And in the summer of 2008, it was a September election. And in that, oh, it was October, sorry. We were campaigning in September. In August of that year, price of gas was very, very high. And the world was concerned. They, there was a shortage and people didn't know what they were going to do. By the time we got to September uh, and even into November, the price had come down significantly. Um, it was less than half of what it was at one point. So, something like we saw with the pandemic. You know, during the pandemic, the price was really low. The price got really low when we were in the economic uh, recession that we went through. And I was supposed to go as energy minister to a conference in London. And the conference was to talk about the high price of gas. By the time we got to London, it was to talk about the volatility in gas price because the price of gas wasn't high anymore. And I tell the story only to point out, it's a market-driven economy, right? So the price of gas is something that's decided on the world market. And there's not a lot that a government can do to reduce, but there is something they can do. And the one thing they can do is to reduce their part of the taxes. So let me give you a really simple example. Let's say that gas is a buck a liter. If it's a buck a liter and the federal government is getting five cents in GST, then they're getting five cents per liter, right? So 5% equals five cents. If the price of gas goes to two bucks a liter, they're getting 10 cents in revenue. That's 100% more revenue than what they were getting before. Governments like having that extra revenue. Inflation helps governments grow their top line, their revenue line. And the way that the Harper government dealt with it is we reduced the GST from seven to six to five. And a lot of it had to do with just passing on that, I guess, um, assistance that we were getting. It was a campaign promise, but as well, it did help. Now, some provinces stepped right in and put up their provincial sales tax two points to make up the room from ours. And that's, it is what it is. That's politics. But that being said, there's always something a government can do. And this liberal government can certainly look at the taxes that are currently being paid on, on the price of gasoline and, and not just the carbon tax, the other ones, and determine whether or not they should just normalize it and say the government should not be getting benefit from people experiencing inflation, period. And that's what they should do. And they're not. And, and that really is extended to everything. I mean, gas is just one of the, the parts of the broader inflation issues that are happening yep. right now. Uh, it's everything. So I yep. think that, and you see it, everybody sees it. And I think that's an important thing that the government should probably focus on more, not just talk, but actually take action on. So Doug Ford is going into his election here in Ontario, and mm -hmm. he's already said that's what he's going to mm -hmm. do. He's going to re and Jason Kenney has said the same thing. So they get it. They get the fact that the government should not be able to take advantage or benefit from the hardships that are being put upon their citizens because of inflationary measures. And, you know, I think that this liberal government just really enjoys getting those extra revenues and then going out and spending them the way that they want to spend them. So it's an extra tax on people. It really is. And it's something that like you said, like Doug Ford and Jason Kenney get it. Will Trudeau get it? I don't know, but no, it hasn't he, happened he yet. Wants to, it's not happening. He wants to fund his climate yeah. uh, program. He wants to fund all kinds of different things. So they want, look, they would want this inflation to stick around for a while. Exactly. And we won't dive too deep into it, but I'm just going to leave it at there are conservative, very good conservative um, alternatives and plans for the environment and for yeah. conserving our environment that doesn't yeah. just include taxes. So we're going to go into the next question. So um, this is kind of the transition from politician to private life. So yeah. Evan wants to, Evan wanted to know, you served as an MP for over 10 years, many of mm -hmm. those in government as a minister. What was it like to go from that to private life in 2019? I got my weekends back. <laughs> When you serve, you serve with all your heart and with all your energy, and that's okay. Uh, my family knew and understood. I had two kids who were 
eight and five when I started. And when we went into opposition uh, in 2015, they would have been 12 and nine. So it was, it was easier. Uh, quite frankly. And I got to see a lot. I got to be with them a lot more in opposition than I did when I was in government. Um, but that was the big difference. And now that I'm in private sector, I really do have my weekends for myself. And I get to take on more volunteer things that I have specific interests in instead of spreading myself then. So I can sit on the Community Foundation for Halton. I can sit on a board for Alzheimer's. I can sit on a board for a charity called Care Canada. I couldn't do those things as a member of parliament or a minister because I just didn't have the time. So now, instead of representing an entire community, what I can do is pick the places where I want to put my energies and, and whatever skills I have. So that's, that's the big difference. And then I work for the bank. But the work that I do at the bank is kind of similar to being a minister. You know, I... I look at reports, I think about what's going to happen in the country next, I give advice. So it's kind of similar, except no power. I mean, I can't make a decision, but I can certainly advise people in business what they should and shouldn't be considering when they're making their business decisions. Well, when you look at it, I think you mentioned some great things. You're, you're working, um, well, your job at CIBC and, and, um, and the community boards, you're still serving your community just in a different mm -hmm. way. You're just serving it from a non-elected role, but serving it and bringing yourself and that experience, I guess, that you got from those yep. 10 years as an M over 10 years as an MP and bringing that Absolutely. to different sectors and bringing them and sort of helping that them with that government side of things and sort of, okay, this is how we do it there let's yep. integrate it. Yep, that's it. Exactly. And we're going to go into the next question, which I purposely left a lot of time for for this one, because I know it's something that has been impacting you and your family for a long time. And a lot of people have been, I don't like to use the word watching, but uh, oh, okay. have been seeing your story a lot. Um, so what would you like to say um, to young people about the impact that early onset Alzheimer's mm -hmm. has had on you and your family? And what can we do to be more aware of it and caring of our loved ones who may go through this one day as well? And maybe just for the people who aren't quite familiar with your story, maybe just share that a, sure. a little bit of the story first, and then we'll go into that. Sure. I'll start with my kids who are now 20 and 17, and they were in high school and I think grade seven when um, my husband, not their father, because it's my second marriage, but when my husband, Bruce, was diagnosed with something called early onset Alzheimer's. So usually when you think about Alzheimer's, you think about your grandmother or your grandfather, and it's usually somebody older, and they forget things, and then they don't remember your name, and, and they get more frail, and then they die. So in this case, Alzheimer's is in a young body. So my husband was 56 years old, not very old at all. And his brain started to decay. And he had some pretty terrible side effects. He really couldn't speak very well. He would be looking for words all the time. He forgot to do a lot of stuff. He asked questions incessantly and became angry and had very little patience. And that was a real impact on my family, especially with the two boys, because you know, they've known him since they were babies and he is their stepfather, but it was really tough on them because he went from buying them treats and taking them to hockey and having a lot of fun to threatening to kill them and calling them bad names. And that's the kind of Alzheimer's that he had. He became extremely violent. He threatened me, he threatened the kids. And on January 1st, 2020, 2020, one, 2021. He um, had a really bad attack of, of insanity and wanted to harm me by pushing me through a window. And my younger son, Billy, who was 16 at the time, wanted to intervene physically. And we called 911 as a result. And he ended up, Bruce ended up going into the hospital and then into a specialized unit. And he's still there. He's still in a specialized unit dealing with people who have these psychological symptoms. So what have I learned? Um, my kids have a lot of patience with people and they understand that you never know anybody's real story. So they may be behaving very odd, but you don't know why. And sometimes it's a medical condition and you have to factor that in. So they are a lot more, uh, as I said, a lot more 
patient with people. Um, they also know the value of life. Bruce got this at a very young age and my kids know that they have to live their lives and have to go for it essentially because you don't know how much time you have. They also had to become very serious and they are very protective of me and actually had to step into adult roles a lot quicker than they had. My older son made a decision to go to university closer to me so he wouldn't be away and lots of life effects. So I think if I want, and, and but none of them want to have sympathy of their friends. And luckily they brought their friends around so they could see Bruce's behaviors. We're not ashamed that he has this disease and people should see this disease. And that's why I do so many interviews. So for them, they want people to know that this is a very serious disease. It's a very rare disease and it has real impacts on real lives. It's impacted their childhood. It's impacted my life. Um, I mean, I can't run for prime minister anymore because I have obligations that are far more important than traveling the country and looking for votes. So that's, that's the reality. So I guess my message to folks out there is this, you never know where it's going to come from. You don't know what challenges you're going to have, but patience is the key. And that's, and, and never being relentless and trying to find the solution to the problems that you have and bouncing back and finding your little things. So that would be, that's the message. Well, your story is something that has touched the hearts of many Canadians, including myself. I mean, I used to volunteer in a, in a long-term care facility for uh, prior to the pandemic, which mm -hmm. I'm, I think I'll be able to start going back in, I'm probably going to go after the provincial Good. election in June. I'm going to volunteer in the election and then go back for the summer to the long-term care Good. home. And every day I would, I, well, every day I was there, I would see the impact that dementia and Alzheimer's had mm -hmm. on so many people. And I really started to, similar to what you said and to what your kids have sort of started to see, being, looking at, I guess the preciousness of life of the life that mm -hmm. you have and taking, I wouldn't say take advantage of that, but really, um, yeah, I guess take advantage of everything that you have and live your best life and help those out, mm -hmm. help out those people with, with that have these sorts of, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And I think that, I think that your story is one that I, I think that you have, it's great that you have the platform to be able to share this. I mean, you're touching lots yeah. of young people right now, I'm sure, uh, who are watching this interview and many Canadians who may not know about this sort of, um, yeah. about early onset Alzheimer's. And I don't remember the number. What's the number of people that uh, uh, experience have early, early onset? onset? Yeah. It's very small. small. It's about 4% of the population. So we've got 16,000 cases in Canada, oh, okay. but significant. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of although I'm seeing more and more I have mm -hmm. to say and I feel like everyone's in contact with me at one point and I welcome it I love it mm -hmm. but uh, the you know what else I'm glad Vincenzo you volunteer in long-term care homes and I would just say to folks out there whose grandmothers or grandfathers have dementia the simplest thing you can do simplest thing you can do is to go over and hold their hand human touch and kindness really matters it really matters it's the number one thing that they that they crave a little bit of humanity and dignity. And that's really what it is. I mean, it's just being able to, to reach out and make someone's day a little better and just reach yeah, out to them and, and, ex and share in that experience of what they're going through and doing what you can to, to sort of, to help yeah. out and, and make an impact, make your own impact. So that is, Yes. And we yeah. join politics because mm -hmm. we want to make an impact on the world. And mm -hmm. this is a great way to make a small one. Exactly. And yeah, going back to politics, I think that it, it's also great that many people who are watching this show may be wanting to go into politics one day and yeah. just remembering that every single person has their own story and they every do. single person has their own, um, yeah. their own struggles. And you need to remember that as a politician or someone mm -hmm. who anybody in public service. Yeah, that's it. So we're going to move on to the last part, which is called okay. advice for the next generation, where we talk about okay. youth involvement in politics and more. So I wanted to, we asked this to everybody and we want to ask what should young high school conservatives do in order to get more politically active? And one piece of advice that you would like to give them. Very simple. 
join a campaign. Very, very simple, join a campaign. The best thing you can do is get involved in a campaign. Why? Because we need people in campaigns. We need people to go door knocking. And what's in it for you, um, you get access to the candidate. Like you can go out and talk to the candidate one-on-one. -on -one. You have time to walk with them. Candidates want to spend time with their volunteers. They want to thank them for coming out and door knocking. And as a result, you have the best opportunity to get to know the candidate, even if it's a sitting cabinet minister, best opportunity to go and get to know them. They'll be out there knocking doors. They have to. That's their only role during campaign. So when you go to a campaign, I know lots of people say, well, I'm really good at policy or I'm really good at strategy. You know what? That's not where, that's not where we're talking with the candidate. And that's as well ends up making connections. And don't stop at one at one campaign. If you're interested in getting your name out, then go volunteer on someone else's campaign. You know, you got five nights a week and go out and spend an hour or two hours door knocking. It makes a difference. And some of the kids, kids that uh, knocked on doors for me, I'm still in contact with. I'm their primary um, sponsor. I, I write their I write their performance uh, letters to go to university. And, you know, these things matter and they can come back to me today. If someone came back to me after undergrad and said, will you write me a letter for law school? 100%. And that's why it's so valuable to get that experience of working on a campaign and seeing winning or losing. It is the experience. And if you don't like your candidate, then go to another writing and work on theirs. And it's uh, just gas money at the end of the day. But that's what I would do. And if you can if you join clubs like this one, these are great clubs to get involved because you find like-minded people who care about the same values and issues that you care about. Get involved in the leadership campaign. That's another great place to get involved. Be persistent because you may call them up or email them and, oh, they never get back to me. Go to the office and knock on the door and walk in and say, how can I help? And they'll set you up. You got to go and face. Don't expect passively that they're going to come and find you. You have to go and find them. And that's my best advice. And and you'll be amazed how quickly you can climb that food chain. And well, the definitely. other thing, sorry, Vincenzo, one yeah, more thing. If you ever have the opportunity in life, wherever you are in terms of your education, and you can be a summer intern, or even if you can go and work in a government do it. It'll move your career along more than you possibly think. All great, great, great advice. I mean, I, um, my first full fledged campaign was uh, the recent uh, federal election in September. And it was such a blast mm. being able to, to volunteer and do yeah. everything that I could to help out. It wasn't a successful campaign, unfortunately, okay. but, but you know what, we're going to do it again. We're going to yeah. do it again at the next federal election and we're going to do it yeah. again and we're going to win. And it's just so much yeah. fun. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the provincial election. I'm going to get involved with my yeah, own uh, current MP there. and current yeah. minister, I guess, and get involved with them. And, and um, like you said, there's no shortage of campaigns. There's uh, I'm, we're actually working on the OHSA votes for the 2022 Good. Ontario election. Uh, yeah. There are all but three ridings, uh, three or four ridings right now have a, a candidate and they're slowly trickling in. So there's going to be a right. full slate of candidates, 124 candidates, leadership election. It. Like you said, there's going to be a leadership it. election, great people Good. running, all great people yeah. running. So get involved there and it doesn't matter who it is. And municipal elections too, you can get involved in that. Fine. There's no parties yeah. there, but find someone you agree with and get involved there and just do whatever you can. And Lisa, That's like, it. like you said, I've on this show, we've interviewed so many people and so many great people who have, we've created contacts with and you yeah. being able to have those contacts with fantastic candidates and MPs and MPPs and candidates of records and former MPs like yourself is just yeah. so great. And these, the conversations that you'll have are great. And the people that you meet really, it, the federal election was so short and the amount of people that I met were, was fantastic. And it is. you can yeah. too. <laughs> Everybody you make friends can. for life. Exactly. 100%. Yeah, you do. Cool. So that is it. Thanks, Lisa, so much for joining us today. It was great having you. And uh, we hope to get in, get in contact with you again someday soon. Maybe we can have another interview or something like that. It's, it was great having you today. So that is it. We hope you enjoyed today's interview. Look for more videos coming soon, more interviews coming soon. Follow our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Ontario HS Cons for info about next interview and for more great content. 
Look at our website, ontarioHSConservatives.org to see more about us, see our projects, and for more great content. YouTube viewers, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss a video. Podcast listeners, follow us and stay updated. So we hope to see you all soon. Thank you.